Like, if there was any state that needed a state auditor that was watching these things, you would think it would be Alabama. Uh, I completely agree with you. I mean, it just looks bad for the government to come out and say, yeah, we want to get rid of the auditor's position. I mean, the, the reaction from the voting public is going to be like, wait, the, the one entity that's there to to look <laughs> to make sure right, that the government exactly. isn't wasting our money, <laughs> you're going to get rid of that one? Hey, fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. The next guest that is coming on the program now is one that I have actually never had on the program, Andrew Sorrell, who is the representative from District 3 in the Alabama House, and he just recently announced his candidacy. He is going to be running for the state auditor for the state of Alabama, so let's go ahead and welcome him, on, welcome him on. Thank you so much for being with us, Representative Sorrell. Hey, Caleb. Really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, always a pleasure to uh, pick the brain of some of our elected representatives, especially when they're seeking a higher office. And so without any further ado, I kind of wanted to get right to the heart of the matter. There are a lot of statewide offices, a lot of constitutional offices you could have chosen to run for. Why state auditor? Yeah, it's a really good question. And let me tell you what happened. Two years ago, a bill was introduced. My first year in the legislature, a bill was introduced to eliminate the state auditor's position completely. And what that forced me to do was to really analyze the position, study it, learn about it, and see, is this a position that we could legitimately get rid of? And the conclusion I came to was, no, absolutely not. I have to be opposed to that bill. I think it would be very unwise to eliminate the state auditor's position because it does really three very important things. The first thing that it does is it keeps track of all the state property worth $500 or more. There is $1.7 billion worth of property that the citizens of Alabama own. It's spread out over 176 different state agencies. That property all has to be audited annually. The second thing the auditor does is he appoints, he or she appoints a registrar in 66 of the 67 counties in Alabama. These are the people who register you to vote and perhaps even more importantly, keep the voter rolls clean. And finally, the state auditor serves on the board of adjustment. So the state of Alabama is a sovereign entity. You can't sue the state of Alabama. But if you do have a valid claim against the state or against one of its boards or agencies, you can file your claim with the board of adjustment and the state auditor has one of the votes and hears those cases quarterly. So after I studied the position a little bit, I thought, no, we, we cannot get rid of this position. It's too important for the people of Alabama. And, you know, you, you need you need somebody watching the taxpayers money. I just think that's really important. Well, I appreciate you bringing that up because that was actually going to be one of my next questions is they recently decided to at least look at getting rid of the state officers uh, auditors position. And I think that there are a lot of people I'm not saying that you're one of them. But there are a lot of people in the state of Alabama that look at constitutional offices as just stepping stones to something bigger. And so I actually really appreciate the fact that it sounds like you've studied what the position does and the intricacies of it. And you're not just looking at it as a, uh, a resume builder for a higher office later, that that's something that you're actually interested in what the office does. Yeah, you know, when I ran for state state house, it was because I wanted to be a state representative. There were issues that I wanted to work on, and maybe we can talk about some of those today. Sure. But why I'm running for state auditor is because I want to be state auditor. People say, are you going to be as outspoken as Jim Ziegler was? Look, I'm running for state auditor because I want to do the job of state auditor. If I'm outspoken on other issues, that's secondary to doing the job well. I think, first of all, nobody cares about your opinion. If you're not doing your job well in Montgomery, then nobody really wants your opinion anyway, right? <laughs> Probably so. I, I know I would rank among those that if you're not doing your job, I'm not really concerned with what your opinions are on maybe social issues or whatever. I mean, not that those are invalid, but I do, I would a lot rather you do the job I elected you to do than, you know, spout off about that kind of stuff. Uh, no, I think sure. Jim Ziegler and does a good job of doing both though, so I'm fine with that. I'm fine with it too, and as long as you're, as long as you take care of, you know, your your actual responsibilities first, and you have extra time, you can travel a state and speak to different Republican clubs. You can mm -hmm. go on the radio and talk about issues that you think are important to the people of Alabama. You know, that's 100% okay. I have no problem with that. But I want to be very clear that I'm running for state auditor because I'm interested in the position and I, and I want to do that job. Well, one thing that I was going to ask you about, because even though typically we went to the Secretary of State, who, you know, right now that's that's John Merrill, uh, to ask about issues of voter integrity, it is true that some of the duties that 
our regard voter integrity do fall to the state off, uh, auditor in our state. And so I was wondering, since that has become such a hot button issue, what are some of the things that you would do as state auditor to try to make sure that the integrity of our elections is maintained? Yeah, you're right. People don't realize that the auditor and I think the treasurer even gets an appointment to for, for these registrar boards. And the first thing I would do is I would go to the conferences where the registrars meet annually. I think they get together down in Baldwin County somewhere and they do an annual conference. Mm -hmm. I think the state auditor needs to be in on that. He needs to be learning the same thing. If it's if if he's going to be appointing registrars, he needs to understand the registrar position, the intricacies of that. So I'm going to make it a point to go to all of those conferences myself. And secondarily, I'm just going to interview people and I'm going to ask them, what is your plan to keep the voter rolls clean? What is your plan to figure out who needs to be removed? If, as John Merrill says, if they moved away, passed away or were put away, they need to be taken off the voter rolls. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that the people that I'm that I'm appointing to registrar are, are going to be very, very serious about doing that job. And and that's the thing, too, uh, as far as voter fraud goes, you know, the how widespread it is is a, a matter of great debate. But I think that even the person that contends that our voting system is, is very safe and very reliable would even have to admit that there are some issues occasionally, things that slip through the cracks when it comes to people being on the voter rolls that really shouldn't be. There are things slipping through the cracks, and I've already taken some steps to address these as a legislator. I supported a number of good election reform bills this year. I'll give you an example or two. Okay. One of them was if you vote twice in Alabama, obviously that's illegal. But you know what wasn't illegal? Voting once in Georgia and once in Alabama. If you voted in two different states, that was not against the law in Alabama until huh. this year. Chris Blackshear had a bill to fix that. And we know there were at least six individuals who did in 2018 vote in multiple states. So now whether or not it was intentional or not, we, we, you know, we don't really know. We could get into that. We'd have to go study these individuals to find out. But whether it was in, I don't know how you unintentionally vote in two different states. But no, right. nonetheless, that was an election law that we cleaned up. I'll tell you another one. We banned curbside voting. I don't think we need, we need uh, ballots going uh, out of precincts. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't trust like, here, fill your ballot out in the car and I'm going to carry it back in. Well, how do I know you're going to put it in the machine? How do I know you're not going to alter my ballot before it goes in the machine? You know, it's, it's not a good situation. And the argument against that was, well, you know, these, you know, the handicapped people, you know, I mean, they, they need to be able to just pull up and curbside vote. Well, first of all, handicapped people go to the front of the line already. And right. second, if you're handicapped, you can absentee vote in Alabama. We already have a process in place for that. We don't need to open up this thing where we're and go outside of a precinct and be walked back in by an election worker. We are opening Pandora's box. So that's just two examples of things that I've already done as a legislator to try to close some of those election loopholes in a state where, admittedly, I don't think we have as widespread a voter fraud as perhaps other areas of the country do. I think our elections are run very well here. But even here, there's things we can do to further clean them up. Yeah, I think that that's true. And I think also there's less motive. And I'm, I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't, this isn't something we should focus on because I wouldn't waste my audience's time talking about it if I didn't think it was important. But in Alabama, there's less motive because we're not really a swing state. And so I, I think there's less reasons why somebody would, would try to trick the vote because it would be so hard to get the overwhelming majority to, to get it to swing the other direction. But, you know, it can happen. And one thing that I wanted to ask about because I, I didn't want to, you know, go too far down this rabbit hole. But if you read the media and their reaction to the getting rid of curbside voting in Alabama, you would have thought that we enacted a million dollar poll tax the way that they overreacted to it. Like we, we, yes. were, we were basically <laughs> enacting Jim Crow, but a thousand times worse by saying, no, you cannot do the thing that we literally just invented last year. And that's what's so funny to me about the, the whole voter, uh, you know, tr trying to keep the, uh, the vo voting rights current. I'm fine with us making some occasional uh, temporary measures that we put forward because of people scared of the COVID, COVID vaccine or the, the COVID virus. Uh, not scared of the vaccine. There might be some people afraid of that too. But people that were afraid of the virus, I understand enacting some temporary measures to make voting a little bit easier because of what was going on then. But now they act as though, as though those temporary measures, if those measures that we just put in place last year aren't kept from now until the end of time, it's voter suppression. Oh, yeah, we had to endure a filibuster. Uh, every time we did an election bill, there was a filibuster in the House by the opposing party. And we had to end up cloturing every single election bill we passed this year. We had to cloture the vote just to stop debate because it would have gone on for forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, they would have wasted 24 hours of, of floor time on an issue that was going to be a party line vote 
anyway. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. Look, I don't care if if your party is in power, winning the election, losing the election. We should all be for honest, fair, and free elections. That should right. have been a unanimous vote. No, I, I couldn't agree more, but uh, sort of transitioning topics here. I was recently doing a segment about Alabama's tax burden, and I was quite surprised to find that despite the fact that we are arguably the reddest state in the country uh, by a couple of different measures, you can maybe make an argument for West Virginia, but Alabama's a very red state. Everybody knows that. Despite that, our tax burden, if you combine our sales tax and our income tax and compare that to other states, we're actually well above average. And so how would you, as the state auditor, make sure that those tax dollars are, are being spent well, because, I mean, in my opinion, we're being s severely overtaxed in Alabama, and I, I know that our property tax is low, and that helps make up for it to some degree. But um, how would you make sure that our tax dollars are being well spent and, and serving the people of Alabama and that money is going where it needs to go? So currently, the duties of the state auditor are just to check up on the property, make sure the property isn't disappearing. So that is a very important duty. But what I would do is I would push for the Department of Public Examiners to be put back under the state auditor's office where I believe that it should be. And in fact, I carried that bill this year. I wasn't able to move it, but I had a piece of legislation that would do just that. And when most people think of auditing, that's what they think of. They think of someone going in and, hey, we're going to audit this county commission's books. We're going to make sure no money's disappearing and everything. That's what they think of. That's not the auditor right now. That's the Department of Public Examiners. I forgot that they had moved that, actually. So Yeah, they sure did. My, my bad. And, and, <laughs> I forgot about no, that. No, that's, that's no, and that's, that is a very common misconception, but it's a misconception for a reason. It's because that's probably really the way that it should be. That's the way I would prefer that it to be. Um, besides that, I'm going to continue speaking out. Uh, against higher taxes. Now, when I was in the legislature, I voted against uh, not just the tax increases, but also the fee increases, because fee increases are usually just higher taxes disguised as fees. Right. We had a bill this year, we're going to add $5 fee onto everyone's, uh, you know, boat, uh, you know, title. Uh, well, that's actually just another tax. So, you know, I voted no on that. Um, I sponsored bills to cut taxes. They, none of them went anywhere. None of my tax cut bills ever saw the light of day. I had a bill that would have gotten rid of the grocery tax. It would have phased out the state grocery tax over 20 years. I had a bill that would have eliminated the business personal property tax. I had another bill that would have eliminated the business um, personal property tax. I, so I, I sponsored at least three different tax cut bills. And uh, I, as auditor, I would continue to speak out that, you know, Alabama's tax burden, we, we like to say that we're the reddest state in the nation, but, you know, our policies don't always align with that as closely as they should. Right. And sort of on the other side of that, speaking of your voting record, if I'm not mistaken, didn't I read somewhere that you were the only person that voted against the state's education budget for the past two years? So not just the education budget. I also voted against the, the uh, general fund budget. So Alabama has a bifurcated budget process. We have right. two different budgets. We have education and everything else. I voted against both of them, not because I'm against, you know, funding state troopers. I'm not against paying teachers. I'm not against any of those things. What right, I'm against. Andrew, why do you hate the children? Why, why would you? <laughs> right, exactly. That, that's, I'm <laughs> no. sure you've heard that argument a thousand times when people are actually being serious about it. No, for sure. And there, there's a lot of different reasons that people can vote no on a bill. You know, you sure. don't get to vote no on individual pieces of a bill. I can't go in and say, well, I'm for the money for teachers, but I'm not for, for, for this expenditure. You know, right. it's, yeah. it's all or none. But really, my no vote was, was, was a protest vote. Because I was the only legislator to do it in the House or Senate. But I'm trying to make the point that we are growing the size and scope of our government every year. Even during a pandemic, we found a way to grow the size of government in Alabama at a rate of 3 to 5 percent annually. I campaigned as a small government conservative when I ran for the state legislature, and I intend to vote like one. So I, after my first year in the House, I figured out what was happening. Hey, Republicans are growing government in Alabama. That's, that's not what I'm for. As, as a small government conservative, I couldn't support that. So I did vote no on the budgets each of the last two years. Just out of curiosity, and, and I'm just asking for a frank opinion on your part, do you, do you actually, I assume because you're moving to the state auditor's position, or at least trying to move to the state auditor's position, you believe that you could do more good there than you're currently doing in the House. Is there a reason for that? Do you feel like uh, you just can't make a difference as one of a voting body and you think you'd make a bigger difference as a constitutional officer? Like, what was the motivation behind that? Do you, do you think that maybe you could do more good in the House if you stayed there? 
Well, I could definitely do more good in the house if I stay. I don't mean more. I could do, I could continue to do good. I couldn't do more good. I think I can do more good in the auditor's office. Okay. But I, I did get some good done as a state legislator, and I still have 18 months left. I still have a whole other session left, plus a couple of special sessions likely later this year. Right. I was able to pass a civil asset forfeiture reform bill, passed it unanimously um, in committee and on the House floor. I even got the, um, the minority leader of the Democrats co sponsored my bill. I worked very closely with Senator Arthur Orr on that. We ended up actually passing the Senate version of the bill, SB 210. I carried it in the House, both in committee and on the floor. Uh, Governor signed that bill into law last week. A lot of good reforms in that bill. So I was very proud of that work. I, I've moved constitutional carry farther than anyone else in Alabama has ever been able to move it. I good got luck it passed with that. out. I've been trying for that one forever, and it, it we put it we bring it up every year, and it always fails. It just gets my goat. But anyway, Caleb, it's coming. It is coming. Listen, this well, year I, I got so. an eight to four. I got an eight to four vote in the public safety committee. It came out, shocked everyone. Um, but you know, those public safety committee members, um, I've I've been working on them for three years, and you know, some of them have just changed their mind. You know, we've had great discussions about it, and they slowly said, you know what, you're right. You shouldn't be able to charge somebody for what is their constitutional right. Exactly. And I was I was very pleased that, as far as I know, every Republican on that committee voted for my bill this year. And uh, next year, I believe you'll see that bill on the House floor. And I, I mean, just to be quite frank, I don't see a bunch of Republicans voting no on a gun bill in an election year. I, I think the bill will probably pass next year. So I have been successful in the House. I've really enjoyed it in the House. But I do think that keeping track of $1.7 billion worth of taxpayers' property that's an important job. I think I could do a lot of good in that position. Well, as somebody that tends to be a budget hawk, I really kind of want to get your idea on this, and, and maybe this will give us a little insight into how you would handle um, ha handle things in the future when it comes to this. Uh, what's your opinion on merging the two budgets? Because I, I think that there's good arguments on both sides of this. I tend to like the fact that they're separate and want to keep them separate, but would you be in favor of if there was a proposal for the Alabama – uh, budgets to be merged. And so we would just have one general budget as opposed to a general budget and education budget. Yeah, that's a real lightning rod issue. You know, yeah, if, really if, you merge, <laughs> if you merge the budgets, then, you know, the, the, the educators might say, oh, well, they're trying to take money from education or, you know, the, the prisons may say, oh, they're trying to take our prison money and give it to the teachers or what. So it, everyone's suspicious if you ever start trying to merge the two budgets. But would I vote for it? Yes, because I think it's good government to vote for it. The money needs to go to its its best and most efficient use. And if it's tied down in one budget, if you've got 80 million extra in one budget and you really need to have it in the other, you just can't spend it there. So you end up spending it on a second or third priority, whereas you could have it on a first tier priority in the other budget. It doesn't really make any sense. We're one of only three or four states that, that do bifurcate our budget process. And uh, I, I would definitely vote in favor of combining the two budgets. Okay, well, that's interesting to see where you stand. And I actually, like I said, come down on a different side of that issue, mostly just because I'm afraid that uh, the education budget would get completely swallowed by the general. Uh, but I, I understand the arguments for making it uh, a little bit more fluid. I, I genuinely understand that. But um, I, I like the fact that you at least had good rationale for your position on that. Um, so one other thing that I would like to ask... Uh, when it comes to being able to uh, spend our, our tax dollars effectively, is there anything that you could do as state auditor? I know that you, you talked about the fact that that's um, not really as much of what the state auditor does anymore. Um, is there any way that you could uncover fraud or funds being used inefficiently as the auditor? You know, it, it would be difficult. It really would. I mean, first of all, you don't have the staff. There's a staff of only eight or nine people in the auditor's office. The budget has been sliced from $1.2 down to 850,000. Just in the three years that I've been in the legislature, they've been continually slicing the budget for, for Jim Ziegler. They even took his parking spot away. And I think a yeah, lot of that you gotta was- You gotta be kidding me. They took Jim Ziegler's parking spot? They sure did. Yeah, they took his parking <laughs> spot because they, you know Jim Ziegler has been outspoken on issues that aren't necessarily quote in his lane. You know, the auditor you know, it typically doesn't come out and give an opinion on an I-10 toll bridge in Mobile, for instance. Right. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with him doing that. I think that, you know, Alabama was probably 80-20 with him. The citizens of Alabama probably were 80-20 with him on that issue. So, oh, I would agree. But I do think that that impacted the, the, the budget funding for him, and I do think that, in, that that's the reason he no longer has a parking spot. I mean, just the petty little things like that shouldn't happen in government. But they do. But to answer your question, am I going to be able to uncover large amounts of waste, fraud and abuse? Uh, no, because 
there's no budget for that. There's Jim Ziegler literally told me, look, if we have a copier machine break or a flat tire, we're in trouble because we're not going to have the budget to pay for it. And that's how tight it is right now. So unless you're willing to put the Department of Public Examiners back under the auditor and properly fund the office, I don't think you're going to be able to find, um, you know, that, that level of waste and fraud like they did in Mississippi. The state mm -hmm. auditor in Mississippi found millions of dollars that was being uh, stolen, I believe. And it brought that to light. And I, I don't think we're, we're going to be able to have that same level of success in Alabama with things set up the way that they are. Well, and that's kind of an example of one of the things of government that really hacks me off, Andrew, just to be perfectly honest. What they'll do is they'll they'll make a move like that that basically guts the budget and taking the Office of Public Examiners out from under the state auditor. And then a couple of years later, like, well, we might as well just get rid of the position because it's not doing anything. Well, of course it's not doing anything. You took away all its power. <laughs> right. But uh, I don't know. It's just it, it bothers me. And I think that that has been, frankly and unfortunately, a very effective way to make sure that any of the stuff that they're doing sort of under the table goes unnoticed. And it's not like the state of Alabama does not have a history of doing that. It was the state auditor that actually originally found out that Governor Bentley was moving money to help cover up his affair. It, you know, we have the history with Mike Hubbard in the House. And so. Like, if there was any state that needed a state auditor that was watching these things, you would think it would be Alabama. Uh, I completely agree with you. I mean, it just looks bad for the government to come out and say, yeah, we want to get rid of the auditor's position. I mean, the, the reaction from the voting public is going to be like, wait, the, the one entity that's there to, to look <laughs> to make sure right, that the government exactly. isn't wasting our money, <laughs> you're going to get rid of that one? I mean, even if the legislature were to pass the bill, it'd have to go on the ballot. It's a constitutional amendment. Mm. I don't think that people of Alabama are going to vote to eliminate their state auditor. I just don't see it happening. Well, ideally, since we have separate branches of government and have you know the legislature that's supposed to be looking into that and has some oversight over the executive branch and how things are done, I would like to think that our legislature would serve most of those purposes even without the state auditor's help. But unfortunately, we don't have a great track record of making that a reality. Yeah, and the Department of Public Examiners is accountable to the legislature. So, I mean, course, that's yeah. good. I think it would be better if they were accountable to somebody in the executive branch. But my, my opinion on it is if you're accountable to everyone, you're accountable to no one. I mean, how many legislators actually read the annual report from the Department of Public Examiners? I'm going to guess not very many. It's a very, very thick report. So, I, I don't know. I just think it would be better to put it back under the auditor's office. It just makes more sense. Maybe they could do something uh, like Rand Paul does on Festivus where he issues out his airing of grievances and just does it like in twi tweet uh, Twitter form every year. And maybe if they did it that way, that might get more people. Because you know, if it's a summary and it's, it has to be in a tweet, people, I don't know, might be more likely to read it. Um, yeah, you're probably right about that. That's, that's Caleb's brilliant idea to make the state better is to have everything put out in tweet form. <laughs> anyway. All right. So uh, if somebody has heard what you've been saying and they like what they hear, they'd like to support you and see you as the state auditor for Alabama. How would they support you? Where would they go? Well, there's two things they can do. They can go to andrewsorrell.com and Sorrell is S-O-R-R-E-L-L. -L. Yep. Right there and on there, the screen can, for those of you watching. Perfect. They can, they can sign up. They can volunteer. They can request to sign. They can certainly make a donation. We even have a recurring donation option uh, on the website. We'd be very appreciative of that. The other thing you can do is you can look me up on Facebook, Andrew Sorrell for State Auditor. Got about 7,000 people already that follow my page, and I'd be honored to have each of your guests come on there and like and follow my page as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being generous with your time. Representative Andrew Sorrell of House District 3, Muscle Shoals, thank you for being with us. Hey, certainly do appreciate the interview. Thank you, Caleb. All right, and good luck when uh, Election Day comes up about, what, a year and a half from now? It's about 11 months till the primary. Primary oh, right, right, right. June twenty fourth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the that's the one I'm working towards first, and then uh, well, in course, Alabama, that's the big one anyway. So that's correct. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, good luck with that, and we will hopefully talk to you sometime between now and then, and get an update. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good one. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you made it all the way to the end, it must mean you like what you saw and should like and subscribe. That or you were just super bored, wound up here by accident, and were too lazy to turn the video off before now. Now, I hope you're the first type of person, but if you happen to be the second type, doesn't really matter to me, I got a view out of you either way. Huh. Profiting off of the laziness of others. This must be what it feels like to be a Democrat.